This is David McCall, host of the QTS Experience podcast. This week, I'm joined by Dr. James Garvin, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center chief scientist. Dr. Garvin thinks we might have been 50 years ahead of our time in going to the moon. He's also the principal investigator on the Da Vinci mission to Venus, and we discuss how climate and atmosphere on Venus are helping us to better understand our own atmosphere, and also how we search the universe for more planets like ours. There's many other things we talk about, so please enjoy the conversation. And now, here's Dr. James Garvin on the QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on Earth today is data, how we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS experience. Three, two, one. Jim Carvin, thank you for very much for coming on the QTS experience. My pleasure, Dave. Uh, so um, one of the things that I've got to know right off the bat is what is a principal investigator? I think I have an idea of what a chief scientist is, and I would love for you to explain that. But first... What's a principal investigator? That sounds like a pretty cool gig. Right. And it's not a private eye. And uh, people <laughs> ask, you know, I, no connection. So right. um, in, in science mission space at NASA, we compete, like the Olympics does engineering and science, to, to win missions as teams to go explore places, you know, right. on the moon, in the cosmos, the earth. And, and so the concept developed more than 30 years ago was to compete with the leading person, not not the only person, the leading person to be the PI, the principal investigator. And that right. woman or man is responsible for the integrity and delivery of the taxpayer's investment in the mission run by NASA and partners. And so okay. as a PI, we're the responsible, the buck stops here. We have right. to deliver the goods, the science, the performance, the investment by the country in lots of engineering, which makes missions happen the people, the connections, the social media connections, all that stuff for the community, for the public. And so we take that job. I take that job. My colleagues who are PIs extremely seriously because it's a huge privilege to be one. And we go through rather um, Olympic style competition with multiple steps with 1500 page proposals and reviews that are often scathing. And, you know, but anyway, it's a great uh it's an interesting term because it different, differentiates, Dave, the PI leadership to make sure the science is done the way we're promising right. and the project management that makes sure within the resources and the schedule, we're doing the job. So it's a it's an invention by the science community and, and NASA in this case uh, more than 30 years ago to allow us to compete missions. So it's not just a bunch of folks in a dark room deciding, oh, we're going to do this mission now. Right. It's more the community's opportunity. And that's a, a great privilege. Now, is that for every mission has a PI or there is a PI for NASA and you do um, the assignment and the, the evaluation and the determination of which missions get done and then you assign that out? Or is there the, the space, uh, Kennedy may have a PI or Goddard may have a PI, or is it Mars may have a PI. How do you determine how that's allocated and how many of the of you are there? Right. So NASA has four big, you know, mission directors, we call them. Right. One is the science. And that's where all the missions that are openly competed. Again, it's kind of like the Olympics in sports, but for science and engineering to go explore something, Earth, Sun, cosmos, planets. And so in NASA, the PI mode is for the missions that are openly competed. There are okay. some missions that are so big, the Artemis program to put women on the moon, there's no PI. That's the program, like Apollo was in the 60s. Um, right. The project known as the Hubble Space Telescope, there's no PI. There were investigators selected competitively, but and so they might be in a PI of an investigation, but not for the whole mission. The James Webb Space Telescope that's now uh, up in space looking fantastic. There's no PI, but there are leaders of investigations. As a PI for a mission, people like me, and there's many others, are responsible not just for the investigation, but for the whole project. We have a contract with the senior folks at NASA to deliver that with our team. Now, of course, it's a team effort. I mean, no one right. woman man is going to deliver, and but the buck does stop at the PI. 
How do you, how do you end up? Is that something when you come into NASA and you see these missions that, um, as you move into your career and you say, Hey, I, I really want to do something like that. Or is that, uh, like in your own personal journey, what was it about that that caught your imagination? And the reason why I ask is, um, if you do your job, well, you did your job, right? And, and I don't know that you get a lot of accolades, but there's so many opportunities for it to go wrong. I just went to the Humans to Mars uh, Summit a few weeks ago, kind of accidentally, even though my family's been in to one degree or the other in uh, the aerospace world pretty much my whole life. And it finally dawned on me, you know, space really is trying to kill us. And it really is unfriendly. And this is, a, this is an extreme environment. We use these analogies of sailing and oceans and um, you know, so many things. And yet, this seems like the most extreme of extremes. So what, what about that would attract you to say, man, this life sounds like something I want to sign up for? Well, Dave, good question. We all have our life journeys. So you right. know, um, in my case, I think my mother thought I was, well, I was con- uh, addicted to space at birth. I was okay. apparently the kind of kid that c- looked up at the moon and collected rocks and bugs, much to their parents' chagrin, right. and couldn't be stopped by that. And, you know, maybe that's what we all do, but I perhaps did it more than most. Right. Trail of rocks following me around. I right. lived abroad as a kid, strange ones. But anyway, when I was lucky enough to get a job at NASA, um, I was also lucky enough to work with Sally Ride, the astronaut. Um, and she, in a special a- activity she did, um, was asked to help look at leadership at NASA after a particularly big setback after the Challenger event. Right. And um, there was a small group of us working for her. And as part of that, she really believe strongly in the idea of competing what we do, the way we do in business, in you know sports, in whatever, arts, drama, theater, whatever you do, um, and that the leadership mode in that needs to be something special, something mm-hmm. like a principal investigator, not mm-hmm. the team leader, not the whatever you want to call the right. chief of whatever, but, but a PI, meaning a responsible official who cares about the whole thing and make sure the, in the case of a science mission, that's delivered. Now I'm a scientist curious about too many things. And um, so the opportunity to work with that during my career in different ways, I worked on the NASA headquarters side with these competitions to help other PIs be selected or go through an evaluation to be selected. I did that for the Mars program as part mm-hmm. of my career um, um, for a while. And now I've been lucky enough to go through that cycle myself and with many colleagues. I mean, I have two deputies that are brilliant women who I'm so fortunate to be working with um, as as part of our team. But anyway, we we kept competing to bring the United States back into the atmosphere of Venus um, in a way that no one's done here in the United States since the 70s, you know, mm. think back that far. So right. I was struck as a young person about this opportunity. And look, it's not for the faint of heart. It's an all-consuming job. I mean, it took us two years and 1500 pages of documents that all were peer reviewed and we got yelled at through reviews. Right. To have a chance of being selected by the senior NASA officials that do that job. So right. just to get to the dance floor, it's like the final four in basketball. It's good enough to get to the final four. To win is, you know, amazing. And and so all of us have had that privilege, you know, are just thrilled. So I was just organically connected to it, I think. It's part of my NASA career, which has been fairly lengthy. I love that story. But I'm, I'm curious in that when I was a kid, late 60s, early 70s, um, there was a, at least in the public's eye, I, it feels like, like a magic around um, space, space travel. That was the, um, right, the days of Star Trek. And we, um, that show that so... At the time, you know, it's become this massive cult uh, following, and it's, it's more popular now than it ever was in the '60s. But it's, but it, but it ca- t- completely captured our imagination. And there's a, there's a romance related to this, and and people don't realize how big uh, stars and celebrities, astronauts were back then, and so the culture really bought into it, um, and then. It, it kind of waned. It felt like at the end of the 70s, my dad was part of the uh, shuttle program for many, many years. 
uh, through IBM and lived there in uh, NASA Bay and Kima and Seabrook and whatever out there at the yeah. uh, Space Center. Right around the corner from us was Jim Lovell lived. I didn't even know that till after I saw Apollo 13. I was telling my dad, what a great movie. And he says, he lives right 10 houses down or whatever it was. Um, we got to meet Young and Crippen, the first astronauts. And so there was kind of, at least in that area, this sort of this um, renaissance, probably not back to the days of Apollo because the whole world was looking at Apollo differently. But I wonder if today, so with my children and uh, people around us, we've taken them to not to landings. I've been to several of the landings, but to a launch, which is if a human being is listening to this and they've never been to a launch, they need to go watch something launch. It's, I don't, I don't know how to compare that experience to anything in on earth, but it doesn't seem like it's the, um, it's the same romance. Then that might be my little narrow bubble, unless I'm around space people who absolutely hundred percent all in, but I'm wondering why do you feel like space travel, exploring, not for not necessarily from your perspective, because you've been caught up with this since you could imagine it, right? But just to the population around you, why do you, if you had an opportunity to talk to them, why would you say, in a way that captures their imagination, this is a big deal, this matters? Well, Dave, great point. So, and, and, I was lucky enough to have an experiment fly on the shuttle. It was, you know, one of those great experiences in life to watch yeah. great people fly your thing and actually do things with the shuttle they love to do. Our experiment right. required them to rock and roll the shuttle to do some calibrations. Right. Uh, the crew loved it. They didn't right. get to rock and roll that much, you know. Right. So anyway, <laughs> but coming back to your big question, I think there's always been a mystique about space, partly because it's the unknown, you know, outer right. space. Right. Well, you know, and we have inner space, but, but I think it's more the fact that as people, we're curious about what we don't know in different ways. And we attack that curiosity through the things we hear about. And today space is, is really aspects of, of, of space are everywhere. They connect us through GPS, through telecommunications, through, you know, soon internets all the time, anywhere. Um, we see people in the International Space Station living and breathing and talking and and we see commercial crew being launched, you know, and so and we hear about these missions of discovery that are like great sailing ships, the James Webb mm -hmm. Telescope sailing the photons of the universe. So what I tell people is this, very simply, we live in space. Every mm -hmm. second of every day we are interacting with that space environment. It affects Earth, our parents' star, the sun affects Earth. Understanding our environment, like we do here on Earth as we live as people is important. That allows us to live better, to thrive, to do things, you know, blah, 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 enjoy our families. So getting to know space is part of our DNA and we get to know it in different ways. Sometimes we just enjoy watching it on TV in Star Trek or whatever you like. And, and other times we like it in other shows um, or we experience it by doing it. And some get to do it as astronauts, brave women and men, hats off to them. I, deeply respect them for everything they've done. Others of us are the armchair explorers that send pieces of ourselves. My name is signed on the rover Spirit on the surface of Mars, two levels, three signatures under the president of the United States. Mm. It's pretty cool in yeah. an aluminum thing about this big. But so I think we all are those explorers. And when we think of places out there that may have never been like us, but that can teach us something, that brings it home. When we look at worlds that lost their oceans. I mean, think of that, Dave. We live on an ocean planet. It actually is critical to our successful environment. It was critical to our navigation. We live on an ocean world. Mm -hmm. What if the nearest planet to us was an ocean world for billions of years and lost its oceans? Mm. Holy moly, not mm -hmm. a good thing. What if oceans on our brotherly planet Mars froze out multiple times, producing epics of, you know, massive ice ages due to the way Mars works. And that was the refugia for if there ever were life on Mars. Mm -hmm. What if there are oceans under the crust of Europa and Enceladus and Titan, you know? So those what ifs are the real facts in science. So I'd say to people, look, exploration is something we, in the United States as people, we do it just naturally, organically mm -hmm. in our lives. But when we do it in an organized way, to better understand how we can live better now, but also in 50 years, mm -hmm. in 100 years for our kids, that's important. And we've done that. 
in the 60 odd years of NASA, we've contributed to that with an understanding based system of information that people can choose to use or ignore. And so the act of that exploration, I think it's in all of us. And we, and again, participating depends on a person. I mean, right. I'm not playing NHL hockey as much as I love hockey, um, right. you know, would get killed, but, um, but nonetheless, I love the game, played it as a kid, you know, and, and enjoy it. And so I think space is here to stay. And in fact, I think the space business environment is growing exponentially with opportunities at entrepreneurial level, at space billionaires level, agency level. I think we're going to use space to better lives. And now is the time to get in at the ground floor. And part of that is exploring places that, you know, we think can teach us about ourselves. So that's a long answer to your short question. I hope useful. Yeah, I, th I think it is. One of the things you said that I was hoping I would get a chance to ask you you said this in another talk was that going to the moon or to space for that matter helps us to reopen our mind to cause us to think differently. So a lot of the things that you've, if you, if we didn't say space or whatever, but we, you know, we're 500 years ago and we're, uh, we're, we're talking to the king and queen of Portugal or Spain and saying, we need to take these vessels that are made for the Mediterranean. We need to, we need to reconfigure them and outfit them so that we can sail that way because we believe this is how it's going to benefit the kingdom, you, us, whatever, right? What, whatever those benefits may be, but, but can you, and so that's not an uncommon conversation because human beings, I can imagine Eric the Red saying to his tribe, we got to load these things up because we're going to go explore to raid and plunder or whatever, whatever the motivation was. So human beings do these things. Um, but you said, I thought that was a really interesting phrase to reopen our mind, to think differently. How, what did you mean by that? If you remember that? I do. And so I think we're, we're earth centric people. Mm -hmm. We're used to the systems we've lived with the civilization, the connections we're used to them. And that's natural. I mean, why wouldn't we be? But sometimes if we look at something so different, that was never like us, we bring it back home and we say, Oh, we didn't know that. I give an example to school kids. Um, we found giant volcanoes on Mars that are almost 90,000 feet high. Well, if we had them on Earth, they'd crumble. We would not be able to sustain that load. It's like building a big building and having it fall down or a, right. or a castle in a swamp, you know, to quote a famous comedian um, show. But, um, but anyway, in this case, we looked at them and we saw, geez, this giant mountain on Mars and its cousins have these giant cliff lines, these big escarpments along them that are, you know, 5,000, 10,000 feet high. Hmm, what's going on? And we thought about it and we looked and said, well, we've never had that on earth. Nah. And then we realized, yes, we do. All that action is under the ocean right. with these giant flank slopes of massive volcanoes in Hawaii, in the Canaries, in the Azores. And those sometimes fall apart and break and produce things that affect lives. Right. Tsunamis, the tsunami in January was 45 feet high and in, engulfed the islands of Tonga and the Southwest Pacific from one little volcano that exploded, one right. little one. So when we look at other worlds, we learn things that we didn't think to learn on earth. It could be about how life works or how climate works or how rocks work or how the sun affects them or how magnetic fields work. These are esoteric things, but important to the livability and habitability of our planet for us, mm. for the long haul not just now. And right. so that's important. I think going to the moon catalyzed this thinking with people that went, you'd mentioned, you know, uh, Captain John Young, what a great right. dude. Um, you know, uh, you know, they, they opened our eyes with their own just descriptions of what they did in those grand voyages, perhaps 50 years ahead of their time. Right. We went, I mean, just amazingly so. And so I think that, that, opening our eyes is an important thing. And sometimes we don't have opportunities to do that as people. We're caught up in what we have to do. It's great. But if we look beyond sometimes and see it for what it really is and bring it home and apply that to us, mm -hmm. we, we awaken things, we discover things. And that's what we're doing as we look at the universe, the solar system, the sun and its connections to earth, because we're all part of a big system. And we can't deny that. I mean, it looks better in Star Trek where you can, you know, go, right. let's, let's go warp nine, Scotty, and get out of right. here. Okay, good. Um, but it's a little less convenient here on impulse constantly, but you know, we live with it. 
And, and so I think that's it, Dave. We, we learn sometimes by analogy and we bring the analogy home and we apply it. And that's, that's brilliant. And I think as people, we do that really well. Um, and it's a history, you know, here in the US at NASA, it's one of the things we wanna do. That's our job in some sense. Why do you think, you just said um, maybe 50 years ahead of our time, why do you think we, we might have been ahead of our time? So I think, and this is one person's view, sure. yeah, who grew no up problem. with the mystique of Apollo, who loved it incredibly. <clears throat> um, so I think if you look at the history and you look back in time at the history, you said 500 years ago when the right. first navigation of Earth literally concluded in 1522. I mean, right. when Magellan's one ship got back. Right. Unbelievable that we could do that then, ahead of its time. You know, the next one was 55 years later with Sir Francis Drake. It took that long right. for the navigators. So let's look at the context for Apollo. You know, from 62 to 72, we flew these engineering marvels. We went from zero to landing and living on the moon for a few days, right. driving electric cars, learning how to use digital communication to collect data. Right. Um, we had to invent everything, the rockets, the space flight systems, the operations, the navigation computers, people forget were very critical, um, all this stuff. And so we went to the moon before we even knew the environment we were going into. Right. We remember the famous Apollo 15 thing when, you know, Rapidly rising terrain started telling the commander, Dave Scott, that ooh, the Mons Hadley's a little higher than we thought. What's right. wrong? Well, we didn't have the topography of the moon like we do today, right. um, thanks to missions. So, so we went at the airy edge of technology with some brilliant women and men, and we did it so many times, six times, plus three other practice times from Apollo 8 to 10. Um, just stunning. And, and so some people would say, well, maybe if we'd gone slower, more robotic, we would have gone to stay sooner. And maybe, who knows? I right. won't play the tape backwards, Dave. But right. I think the magic of that of that engineering solution, it was a masterpiece. Um, as we look at it now in hindsight, across 60, 50 years, was probably decades ahead of its time. And we benefited. The heat shield from Apollo let us do Viking to Mars and give, gave us the chutzpah, the confidence that we could do things like that. It let us fly Voyager now beyond the heliopause. I mean, at, you know, billions of miles away. It gave us that confidence. Sometimes you need that. And maybe the setting for it was, you know, science, technical, geopolitical. I mean, we can ask the great historians, sure. not me, I'm a science guy, but right. I think it was early because we're still vying to recreate some of that in ways that are cheaper, smarter, more engaging, um, so that we can do it for good. And, and that's, you know, that's that's the architecture of Artemis and all the other programs like that to recreate it so we can do more of it, not have to rebuild that that one time brilliant system. You know, that was I mean, it was a gem. It was the engineering feat of the 20th century, some would argue. Um, if, if not all time. I mean, it, maybe. it's it's truly it's. But here's my I guess this is my question as you're talking. It reminded me of this um, to uh, a comment and then, a, I guess, a question. One is I remember talking to a friend of mine who um, I'm a former airborne infantry guy and my buddy was a ranger and then uh, became a pastor after he got what, what a great career path there became a pastor. But anyway, he ended up in the early 90s, early days of the Gulf War. The military said we're we're really running short on chaplains, and so he volunteered to be a reserve chaplain and went and did a bunch of special operations stuff. And I got a chance to talk to him ten years in, and I had had a question. Both of my grandparents fought in uh, World War II. My dad was in the Air Force just before um, Vietnam, and most of my family, one way or the other, has served in some capacity in some whether it's the Coast Guard or whatever. Um, none of us career just, you know, do what we thought was important, um, or they served in some civilian. I would consider NASA's part of strategic defense. You know, not the same, but the same sort of. How do I learn? How do I submit to authority and learn how to serve my fellow citizens? Let's just say it that way. Anyway, so I asked my friend Clay about <clears throat> the experience of of the soldiers that he knew that were coming home from Vietnam when he was in um, as a soldier and the soldiers now coming home from uh, the Gulf War. And he said, you know, there's a lot of similarities. 
Um, specifically, I was talking to him about PTSD, and he said, but there is a cultural difference before Vietnam of the soldiers in World War II because they had come out of the Great Depression. They had come out of so many other parts of America, and he wasn't denigrating one group or elevating the other. He was just by way of explanation said, this group seemed to be pioneer stock. They just... The, the way that they were, uh, the way they saw the world, the suffering that they had already suffered. There was a, it was a different kind of thing. And then you add the political sort of your welcome back as a hero as opposed to not a hero, being um, as gentle as possible uh, in comparing those wars. Anyway, as we, re- what does that have to do with this NASA conversation? For, for me, when I was a kid, both of my parents worked. Uh, my, I was uh, probably 12 years old. My sister was 10. My brother was six. We were given our buck and a quarter. We'd walk three miles. I'm not even exaggerating in the Houston area there to the county pool. We'd spend the day at the pool. We'd walk home half the time on fire roads or railroad tracks. My parents probably going to be investigated by uh, child protective <laughs> services now, but it's my whole neighborhood. Everybody I knew there wasn't a bicycle helmet in sight, and I'm not advocating for getting rid of safety measures or anything like that, but you, as probably your experience, you left in the morning, you came home when the street lamps came on, and um, if you didn't come home, the go-to move wasn't something happened to you, it was start calling the neighbors or checking out, which in almost every case, that was the case. But we just had a spirit of... Um, there was less protection. I, I don't know. I mean, whatever it was. Of course, my community also looked out. If anybody saw some shenanigans going on, if I'm walking down the sidewalk to the pool in a, you know, in a 45 minute walk and somebody's harassing me on the side of the road, four cars would stop to intervene to make sure. So, it w- you know, whatever the comparison is. But anyway, now we don't want our kids to ride out of their cul-de-sac. We want them to be where we can hear them, where we can see them. They're tethered with their cell phone to us or all these other things. And I'm wondering if back in the, you know, we talk about Apollo, but before Apollo, we have Mercury and Gemini and literally strapping ourselves in these crazy little cans. When you go through some of the space centers and you see this was their suit, this was the thing they put themselves into. People lost their lives. And even kind of corresponding with that, Joe Walker and Chuck Yeager and Don Malik and all these test pilots, not in the space program, but finding these ex- flying these experimental aircraft, it felt like that era was that same kind of pioneer stock. You know, a lot of these guys had served or were related to the military, and there was a there was an accepted safety um, threshold that felt like it was much lower and we're going to take really big chances. And we all are aware of it when it, when we don't make it, when a system fails or we misjudge something and there's a a disaster and a tragedy, but it felt like that was kind of that rugged edge of exploration. Do we still have that? Or is it like some of the cool things I saw at the humans to Mars was not only were there so many women involved, and women of uh, uh, of every color, and men of every color, they didn't really think about it like a big deal. Like it wasn't, hey, let's talk about us as women. It was, we're women, and we're smart, and we're capable, and we're here, and we, we're complimentary. It wasn't get rid of the guys. It was this be- really cool, almost per- like ahead of it, the rest of social uh, science on here's how you just do it. Like we don't have time to be lazy and kind of fall into that political nonsense. So I really dug that. So that we want to add and we want to grow um, that esprit de corps. But do we still have that, um, well, let's just strap it on and see if this works kind of thing? Or are we insulating ourselves with safety and systems that maybe impedes that? I, I don't I don't know the answer to that, but you, you kind of triggered that thought when we were talking about maybe we were ahead of ourselves. What do you, how would you react to that long-winded common in question. No, Dave, that's that's well put. And so let's let's look at things for a minute. Um, we've come a long way. The first generation we of, of people in space that pioneered things that today we would do with robotics and with massive digital communication and in situ computation that you couldn't imagine back in the 70s. Um, we've extended ourselves the way we extend ourselves to intercommunicate here on Earth. Exploration's different. It's more communal. It can be participatory, but in a passive way. 
Um, and so I think we've learned. And so that first wave was, like you said, at the hairy edge, the pioneering spirit. My father was in World War II in Germany. You mm -hmm. know, wouldn't talk about aspects of it. One of his friends was in the Pacific, refused ever to talk about it, right. but, you know, came home, right. had lives. Um, so that was a different time, a different setting for us as Americans, as people of planet Earth. So I think today that spirit is distributed and, mm. and it's exciting because I, I think those those boundaries we had, way too few women involved, you know, only certain uh, special kind of people could be right. players, if you will, has changed. It needs to be more engaging, more inclusive, so we can do the kind of things we're trying to do. The James right. Webb Telescope didn't just fall off a table. It right. took 20 years of planning and design to be able to even try to do what it's doing, which is, you know, an order of magnitude better than Hubble. We don't normally make leaps like that. And of course, we went from zero to Apollo in a decade. Right. And that's, you know, that's evolution at its steepest gradient. So I right. think today, the, the, the generation that's going to pick up and carry all this forward, um, the young women and men of all walks of life and whatever they are, um, I think they're ready to attack that edginess in ways that we weren't thinking about, as you said, in the late 60s and 70s, coming out of the World War II era. You know, mm -hmm. the boomers attacked it by going and doing something hard and showing it could be done. Right. Let's say it that way. And mm -hmm. very well. And a lot of the secret sauce of it was brilliant engineering and people working 24 seven that no one really sees. I mean, right. they don't even realize some of the little pieces that had to work, but it worked. We declared victory. Apollo 13 came home with Jim Lovell, who was also right. Apollo 8, of course. You right. know, incredible people. I think we have the same incredible people, but there's more of them. Those young women that will be the first women on the moon in Artemis, right. um, they will be the role models, but it won't be just, you know, one or two. Right. There'll be more. And so, and participating in robotic exploration has even widened the, you know, the inclusion space. And now with the way we communicate, social media, digitally, online, all the ways we're doing right now, allow more people to see more stuff in more ways. So I think exploration is changing. There's still a place for that brave, intrepid explorer, woman or man to go and do something here on Earth, in the ocean, climbing mountains, blah, blah, blah. It's there. But in space, I think we're seeing this massive diversification. People go where the action is, where they can go, where engineering can take them, hopefully right. sustainably. Robots go to open the frontiers they can't go to. Right. And they work together in a new partnership. We didn't have that partnership in 1970. The robotics were there to keep you from dying, not right. to allow you to not have to go over the hill into a lunar crater that's 25 degrees Kelvin. Probably not a good place for you and your spacesuit, but the robot doesn't care. It goes, comes back, brings you what you wanted, all is good. So I think that change is, is how evolution and exploration works. And we're seeing it and living it. Isn't that exciting? In the 50 years since Apollo, we've seen that. So the science fiction we love, Star Trek, you know, I'm still waiting for the warp drive. But anyway, right. that's Star Trek or, you know, in Dune, the uh, the hayliners and folding the space time. You know, however we do it, those things are still not here. But a lot of the rest of it is here. We have the scanners and we can do the sensing and we can send back gigabits a second of data. Um, we're learning to work on the quantum frontier. These things were Star Trek and science fiction books. Now we're making some of them science engineering fact. And right. that's only in a generation, Dave. So I, I think your, your leading was brilliant. It talked about a great generation that did amazing things. And it just the way we do those things change. Not that we don't still need to do some of those incredibly brave and courageous things, which I see NASA people doing in their jobs as they push engineering, test things. I mean, you know, to go to new places, eventually some with people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's what we're doing. So um, stay tuned. We've yeah. just begun. I hope so. I, 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 it, it's interesting. We don't, in the same way that we developed a commercial air flight, we don't just send a, a, a plane up without multiple redundant systems because we frown upon them falling out of the sky with our family members on them. And so I, I get that. I want safe. At the same time, I, my imagination was captured when I was a kid. Our neighbor was the chief test pilot for NASA at the time, Don Malik. And 
pictures of him with his jet pack flying him around the Mojave Desert out at Edwards. And I'm sure things like that still go on. But this, there was this, um, there was this ragged edge of let's test this, let's test that. And I hope that in our, in our, in our interest of moving forward, we don't so wrap things in a safety bubble that there isn't still some of that. And part of that is, you know, we, you, we started off this conversation about talking about principal investigator and, and the way that you have to compete to become a principal investigator and to maintain that status. In the same way, we as a nation, in pursuing really real assets, and I'll talk about that later. I've got some questions about that later in the our talk. But if we're not pushing the edge, our competitors may. And I don't want to do it unethically. That's not what I mean. Or force people into taking risks that are foolish risks. But I, I just want to. It seems to me that um, there was a there was a very obvious kind of ragged edge. Not really sure how this is going to work out. But we, you know. Almost the NASA version of "Hey, y'all, hold my beer," right? Not quite. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but just kind of off we go. As opposed to, I just didn't even know me as a parent how much more protective I was than my parents were. I don't think they loved me more, but right. it was um, there was an accepted risk level that was different culturally than today. We can spend all our conversation on that. I don't want to do that. I am curious about this one thing, though. You mentioned Venus in the beginning, and we're going to spend some time hopefully talking about Venus. But before we do that, why do you think of all the bodies around us other than the moon, the next one that I hear the most talked about is Mars. Mars, Mars, Mars. Almost Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. If if Venus is Janet, why are we always talking about Marsha? I'm just. Is it just because of our cultural history around the world that we've always been fascinated by this idea of Martians as opposed to uh, Venetians or whoever they might be. Why do you think Mars so has dominated the conversation to date? Well, I think Mars has that mystique. In fact, I think the idea of exploring Mars is, you know, it, it's kind of a visceral thing for people. And here's the reason why, Dave, bluntly. Okay. We can see it in the sky. We can see the changing patterns on it. We've seen it astronomically like that since the 19th century. Right. So it has shown us its face, its ever-changing face. It reminds us, although it's a beguiling world, that it looks like Earth. Maybe it was like Earth. Ice caps, mountains, volcanoes, river valleys. Our first orbiter, Mariner 9, that saw it uncovered, well, not our first, but our first one that mapped it all, uncovered these Earth-like landscapes. And so it was a draw. And the fact that what we understood about it could could potentially have been habitable by the definition of life at extremes as we have come to understand them made it all that better. Mars was the place to go and ask that question. Are we alone in the first good place? Now, that's not to say there aren't other good places. Why not the moon? Well, it has not had an atmosphere for 4.6 billion years, so a little right. hard. Water works in a different way on the moon. It does work there incredibly. Right. And we're learning that. Um, Venus, too hard to get to, too hard to understand, not enough exploration, an engineering challenge at every step. Let's wait for Venus. Ironically, mm -hmm. though, I have to tell this story. Um, yeah. About uh, 103 years ago, on the cover of the New York Times, there was a big article, Life on Venus, that's where we should go. The clouds on Venus, the surface, it's probably a big swamp, let's go. Mars is too cold, the moon is no air, let's do Venus. So. Circa 1919, coming out of the First World War, the writers and science guiders of the New York Times right. wrote that article. And little did we know, as we got to know Venus, that she was a different, a different beast. So I think what happened with Mars is, Dave, we caught the Mars bug. We mm. saw it. We, we decided, let's, like Apollo, let's go look for life directly as if it's just going to be there as a life force, like our microbial earth. And so we did. Viking was brilliant. It did everything. Mapped, imaged, biology experiments, you know, chemistry. We did it all. And what we found was Mars is a little trickier. Mm. It's a beguiling story, a kind of Shakespearean. And, and so, but that made it even more interesting. And when we went back, we saw the, the ephemeral history of water, hillsides that may erupt with gullies, maybe brines, ice caps that are water, not frozen 
not the dry ice that we thought it was. Mm. Wild climate oscillations, river valley networks that tell us there was a lot of water. Mm. So people started to think, well, maybe Mars remains and is, as we've used with our Mars program for the last 20, 22 years. Maybe it is the place to ask that big question that humans have been curious about for so long. Are we alone mm. in a way that's close enough that we could understand what it means. I mean, if if we're not alone and they're 10 light years away, okay, all right, fine. We could mm -hmm. think about that. But if they're, you know, 150 million kilometers away, well, now we can get there. And so mm -hmm. the fact that it's accessible, that engineering works, that we have this, this allure to go there ourselves, to be the Martian explorers, you know, going back to Ray Bradbury, we are the Martians and, and others. Um, the Star Trek Voyager, when they went back in time and saw first missions to Mars, you know, all those things. I think that's there. The, and so Mars is a mystique. It's almost a state of mind. Could there have been life on Mars? Of course. We haven't read the records well enough to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going. Mm -hmm. We have perseverance there now. Sample return. Mars life explorer is coming. We want to map the buried ice sheets of Mars, which I promise you are there. We just haven't done it yet. Lots right. to do. So I think the world wants to go to Mars. It's an obvious destination for women and men too, right. because we could go, we could stretch the technology we will use from Artemis to go to Mars. Venus, well, how do you go to a place where the surface pressure is equivalent to being a kilometer deep in the ocean? Oh, but it's also 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm, engineering challenges, you know, danger Will Robinson is an old quote that came right. comes up. So Mars, draws us because we can do it. Engineering is ready. We think the questions are compelling. If we learn that there's relic microbial life or biosignatures of that on Mars, and it didn't advance the way we consider our life on Earth has, then that's a big result. If we learn we can't find it, that's a big result. If it's buried in the ice sheets, but we can't get to them yet, that's a big result. So many possibilities. And I don't think we've seen anything at Mars yet. I mean, even in spite of 25 years of brilliant robotic exploration. So we want to go. I think we should go. That's my view, not so, the agency So let view. me ask you this. I'm, I, I'm sitting here smiling because I feel like you're standing there talking to the um, person who's going to sell you a ticket. You've said, what's the destination I should go to? And this person has just described, I don't know, Quebec City or... Um, you know, um, somewhere in Italy, you know, Tuscan, Italy, and all of these other things. And then you say, that sounds amazing. Can I get a ticket to Toledo? Like, can I, instead right. of doing that, I'd rather go to this other place out here. What is, what is Death Valley like? Can I, can I get a ticket to that? And so now you're saying, I want to get a ticket to go to Venus. Why with all of those uh, tourist guide, exciting things about Mars. Did you say, yeah, well, I suppose if you're one of those people, but I'd rather go to Venus, that seems interesting to me. Why Venus? Well, so Dave, now, now this, now this gets interesting. So <laughs> okay. what if you had a sister you didn't know? Okay. Think of that. You grew up, you had a great life. You loved Houston. The pool was really right. good. You know, you met the test pilots and you had this sister you didn't know. And right. she was cool too but you didn't know her mm -hmm. and she's just down the street or just in right. the city across, you know, up in Dallas or wherever right. you're from, right. you know? So I look at Venus as the forgotten, maybe too enigmatic, maybe too bizarre sister that we're just at the edge of knowing well enough to see that she is going to tell us something great. You know, it's like, it's like you're looking for the pony in the room with other stuff, as you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And, so I look at Venus and say, well, let's just play the tape backwards for a minute. Venus is an Earth-sized planet in a, in a neighborhood around our sun that should be the so-called habitable zone. We actually are starting to define it as the Venus zone. Okay. It's very conceivable Venus started its early life. We need to measure it. We haven't. Right. In a much more clement state, maybe even a habitable one with a nice carbon dioxide, nitrogen atmosphere. Okay. You could live in that not us so much, right. not 900 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a hundred degrees, um, an atmosphere that was earth scale, maybe growing by volcanoes erupting, comets hitting all that good stuff. Um, possibly 
either a big steamy atmosphere or global oceans. What if Venus had global oceans? Mm. And through a, a twist of fate, um, it's a slow rotator, not a fast rotator like Earth and Mars, through a various set of conditions, it lost them. So there's a history on Venus of actually going through a cycle, <clears throat> excuse me, of being a habitable world with oceans and all the good stuff to the world of today that we see, that we think we see. Mm -hmm. And so to me, as an exploring type person, I'm curious, um, and I worked on Venus missions in the 70s, ironically, uh, and 80s, I should say, that were flown by another country, not us, mm -hmm. um, that landed there, wrote my PhD thesis on data from those missions mm -hmm. about the possibilities. I see Venus as a world with untapped possibilities. Mm -hmm. So by going there with a series of missions that we're now planning at NASA in Europe, um, India, by going there and uncovering those secrets, the way we did Mars in 1970 to 76, I think we're going to find this Rosetta Stone, this planet next door, this exoplanet next door with climate change wrong amok. We're worried about climate change here. Okay. Right. Venus is, is off the charts. So don't we want to get to know that? And we can. We have the tools with robotic spaceflight to do that. Someday maybe women and men will go into orbit around Venus <clears throat> and use the command authority to be there close to do more. That's been talked about mm -hmm. by some great people. So I see Venus as an, a massive opportunity for a small investment. The price of a blockbuster movie by <clears throat> James Cameron or other mm -hmm. great movie makers, you know, the guy who made Top Gun, mm -hmm. whatever. For that investment, we can send robotic emissaries to Venus and figure out what she's trying to tell us. And I promise you, Dave, while I don't know what we're going to find, mm -hmm. the possibilities are so exciting. I mean, if Venus had global oceans until a billion years ago when life started to get interesting on Earth. Mm -hmm. Think about that record of billions of years of oceanic existence right during the time when first life got started on Earth. We could learn from Venus <clears throat> about those onset conditions of the life that made us on this great planet. So I think we need to get to know all of our sisters. Venus mm -hmm. is one of them. Um, we've just finished mapping Mercury with Messenger. Other missions are on the way. Mars, we have a, vis a visible presence there with our orbiters, um, with MRO and MAVEN, with our rovers. Um, we're going back to Jupiter. We're there with Juno. We're going back with Europa Clipper. Mm -hmm. We're covering these worlds. We're going to Titan around Saturn. We're going to see the Trojans, and we're going to go see Psyche, the metal asteroid. Mm -hmm. Venus is the forgotten stepsister. Mm -hmm. So let's go figure out her, because I know, Dave, <clears throat> the colleagues who tell me, so mm -hmm. not so much me. Mm -hmm. Venuses are the big Earth-sized exoplanet that telescopes like the James Webb will be able to look for. Mm -hmm. We can see exo-Venuses. We won't find an exo-Earth too mm -hmm. hard based on the capabilities of our telescopes. Mm -hmm. But these great observatories beyond James Webb to the next ones that humanity will fly, will be able to use exo-Venuses as clues. To get to know an exo-Venus, we need to know our own Venus. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we don't, because she's a hard obstacle, for engineering, mm -hmm. with all the other good stuff we can do in Mars and the moon, why go to Venus? Mm -hmm. You know, but explorers went to places that weren't always the initial Rosetta Stone in the oceanic space on Earth, and they discovered great stuff. They went to Australia. What a great place. Wasn't their first stop, <clears throat> right. but what a great place. They went to places in North America. They went to all over. I mean, I don't need to list. Right. So I think Venus is going to be the hot place. You know, if Mars is a cold, wild brother, Venus is going to be that hot sister. And I think we haven't seen anything yet, Dave. Why is it easier to find an exo Venus in, by the telescopes than a, a different type of planet? Is there a signature about it or, or some way that we... Well, because of the techniques we use, mm -hmm. it's called transiting exoplanetary spectroscopy. A planet moves in front of its sun, it blinks out, our massive telescope with its spectrometers can see what happens as the lens of light from that other star shines through the massive atmosphere of a planet like Venus, mm -hmm. um, and we can tell what it's made of. We can see what the atmosphere is made of against the backdrop of suns that are a little smaller than ours. Our Earth's atmosphere is too, it's too thin. We mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to tell. Mm -hmm. But a big atmosphere like Venus, hundreds of times bigger than Earth's, will be detectable. And mm -hmm. so if we see those signatures, CO2, oxygen, other things that are spectrometers on the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to see, 
we will be able to know. So as we detect exovenuses, which all the great astrophysicists are convinced, and we have several in our Da Vinci mission team going to Venus ourselves, mm -hmm. um, we'll be able to produce ground truth. So those colleagues will be able to use the signatures they measure with that great telescope to see, are they like the Venus of today? Are they different? Maybe they're back in time. They didn't get as far as our Venus with a runaway greenhouse case. So mm -hmm. I'm bullish on Venus day because I just, I know there's a story that Venus is going to tell us for our own world. Mm -hmm. And and it's always good to know those stories, even if they're not immediate, even if they're Earth plus three billion, right. whatever. It's still good to know those things. The same right. way Mars right. minus three billion was a real happening place. You know, that's exploration. It's not always in the same time. We look at ancient Egypt. Wow, it's so cool. I went to King Tut's tomb before they moved stuff as a kid. Right. It was rocking, let me right. tell you, to see stuff. I was the only kid down in there. I mean, it was right. like, wow. And right. so think of that. We're literally doing archaeology of planetary histories by going to these places. And, you know, yes, we can go to some of them ourselves. The moon. Mm -hmm. Women will go to the moon. Mars, mm -hmm. I dearly hope. I think it's mm -hmm. a destination place for humanity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from this planet. But Venus is probably left to the robots right now until we see how she works. And then we can open our eyes and our doors and our systems to see how we get to know Venus better. And so I'm just, Dave, I'm convinced Venus is hiding a story for us and we just got to go find it. Is there as much, in, I mean, obviously you're spectacularly enthusiastic. Now I'm interested in learning more. How, is there, within the circles that you run, is there that that same level of enthusiasm or is that something that even to your peer group you have to proselytize to get them on board with look there's value here because i imagine i know nasa's budget is tiny we always talk about <coughs> or i've heard many times why would we spend why, why couldn't we take the money for space exploration and put into this other things until you put it in context this is not a lot of money really um, even if they, and they should up the, in my opinion, up the budget of NASA, you alluded to this earlier, but it is almost every digital innovation. I can't think of one, so I don't want to say a hundred percent, but almost every single one is directly related to the space program or the space program has taken something that was started and enhanced it in a way, accelerated it in a way that probably in and of itself it wouldn't have been accelerated. And and that's another way of saying it benefits human beings on Earth as we explore our own oceans, as we develop our own digital technologies, as we deal with our own climate change and all these other things. Uh, but within your peer group, are you able to um, capture their imagination or are they primarily focused lunar and Martian? I think it's a changing landscape, Dave. And so mm. at one point after... After the mid 90s, NASA had finished the brilliant Magellan mission that mapped Venus with this, this synthetic right. aperture radar. It was a big thing. A lot of people in the 70s wanted to do it. It took us till the 90s to do it. Things take time. You have to be patient right. in space, right. as we all know. Um, but uh, but anyway, I think that recognition started to build. Now, however, meanwhile, there was Mars. There was Europa. There was back to the moon. There was um, going to Saturn. There was you know understanding Earth environmental systems really well and all those things so i think what happened was we realized we know more about mars and the moon and in some ways we have this sister planet that's largely undiscovered mm. and she's next door mm. and so maybe maybe we can pause and i think the community of, of planetary explorers and scientists realize that and that's why recently in the last year three venus missions have been selected by space agencies mm. two by nasa one to do incredible mapping with radar and, and stuff, and ours to go into the atmosphere, to send to the surface over the mountains, you know. And we haven't done those kind of things at Venus as a world community of planetary people since the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. I mean, by the time we get there, it will have been 50 years since the United States touched the atmosphere of Venus. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a recognition this is a thing. Our administrator announced the selections himself that's a big deal to us to have, you know, Administrator Nelson come out and stand there on the stage with our lead scientist, uh, Dr. Zerbukin, and say, we're going back to Venus. I mean, right. 
You don't often get that in these competitions. So I think the leadership, the investment, the people involved, the competition that got us here was, you know, we can we bid our mission to Venus four times. So, right. you know, we we lost the Super Bowl four times. <laughs> Didn't know if we get back, and it's not the Super Bowl. I mean, that's bigger. But but anyway, we lost a lot of times. Some people would have said, get a different coach, you know, right. or or you know, a better quarterback. But we right. we got there as a community. So I think now the community is ready, and everyone's interested. Entrepreneurs want to go to Venus. Um, other nations want to go back to Venus. And so as a world community, I think we realize it's been forgotten too long, and we got to come back. Without getting too political, I want to just segue i think there's a great segue into the global stage of um and, and feel free to opt out we don't have to we don't have to go down this road we get a lot of technologists on the show not all technologists but a lot of technologists and one of the things from the guys at darpa to um just uh, uh, uh academics etc there are there's a lot of conversation around uh, for lack of a better, I'm not going to say an arms race, but a technology race. And it impacts everything. It impacts um, military posturing. It impacts uh, energy. It impacts food production. It impacts p- pretty much every manufacturing in any and every way, um, whether it's artificial intelligence, automation, mechanization, um, d- big data processing. Uh, we just hosted somebody on, uh, Nick Geis uh, from uh, Georgia Tech's Research Institute in storing long-term storage using DNA, an unbelievable, using carbon, synthetic carbon to store electronic data and all of the things related to that. It's <clears throat> spectacularly interesting. And pretty much all of them, to one degree or the other, raise an alarm or at least a comment that Look, we didn't, we don't want to lose the edge that we have with America and its allies. And it's not so much that they are against other nation states that I wouldn't in all cases categorize that. It's more we benefit from being the leaders in in these areas. And I'm wondering if we if we're talking about space exploration and I don't remember who I heard it from, but I'm pretty sure I heard it at the summit where somebody was describing this, and then I'll ask you to respond, in the same way that we go to Antarctica and we start laying out our research compounds and areas. And if you're there early, you've made the investment to get there and invest in the people and the infrastructure and the systems to be there safely and to do your exploration. But if you weren't there or if you don't maintain a presence there, other nations get there and they lay out their footprint. And... And, um, and there are treaties that govern that, and there are relations that govern that. And so they then said, Let, let's extrapolate that to the moon or to Mars or to Venus. If we're not there, setting up these scientific at least communities, it's not, they weren't um, advocating weaponization. But if we're not there setting up these compounds and staking a claim, somebody else will at some point. And so what, what do we lose um, in terms of access to resources or to knowledge or to fill in the blank. And I'm, and I'm wondering, in the same way that people are concerned about losing the technology edge to co- global competitors, is that a reality as we look to space exploration and something that we should be concerned? Make sure that as Americans and its allies, they were very almost always really quick to say, look, we have some really great allies that are like-minded thinkers to us both in private industry and at, as a nation states that we work well with. We have common goals in mind. We have a common view of the value of human beings and, and the value of privacy and these sorts of things. And then we have competitors that don't share those necessarily. They weren't trying to demonize them. They're just saying they don't see it the same way that we do. And so there is value in getting there first and setting up um, – uh, setting up our experiments and our bases and whatever we're going to do. Again, this wasn't a military analogy that I'm listening to, and I'm not trying to allude to that. But do you feel the same imperative, or is it um, much ado about nothing? Well, well, Dave, first, I, first observation. When we go together to explore these hard places, 
-hmm. in partnerships which involve international colleagues and, and all the alliances right we do things better we've done that we've proven that um we can go through the annals of that um right. when we have that international humans going somewhere together we learn more we spread the data better we get people motivated right. i mean yes the advantage of growing the technology to solve tough problems has feedbacks into leadership postures, benefits, things in security that I don't know about. And also right. I really don't, I'm just telling you. Right. Um, so I, I can't comment on those, but I can right. say when we go together, our missions as, as ensembles, as collectives of people that explore things, take the Mars Curiosity Rover, the Mars Science Laboratory. We have investigations from multiple nations. Some contributed on their nickels, you mm -hmm. know, to be part of it. And so I think in some sense, NASA, particularly through some programs, our astrophysics program with James Webb, very international, very strong partnerships to enable that mission launched by the, the you know, the Ariane space, the rocket system from French Guiana, for example, mm -hmm. big partnerships there. Um, missions to Mars, like uh, missions to Saturn, like Cassini, with big partnerships with European colleagues. We have um, instruments from from Russia on the surface of Mars on Curiosity. Mm -hmm. And on orbiters we have around the moon because of partnerships won by competition to do those things. So I say when we go together, in some sense, it unites us with a common goal of learning, exploring, sharing, discovering. We have different ways we share, publish, mm -hmm. move beyond. I mean, in some sense, think of it this way, Dave, the first big space race, Apollo won. Mm -hmm. It did dramatically, brilliantly, we pushed the engineering in ways and made it work. Mm -hmm. Hats off to those great, those great engineers and women and men that made that happen. Because really, mm -hmm. it was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. We won the battle for the first giant space telescope, Hubble Space Telescope, 30 plus years. Um, its record is unrivaled. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's an international expedition, if mm -hmm. you will. We serviced it all those times with, with astronauts fixing it. Uh, my friend John Grunsfeld fixed it three times. He's a good fixer. Um, and, uh, you know, get him back there. But anyway, um, so I think together now, are there strategic value of gaining strategic knowledge that will allow different places in space to be used effectively for whatever reason? Of course. That's what recon's all about. Um, and the resources of space are large. They're, in many ways, they could be countably infinite. How do we discover them and use them beyond the science value? The water on the moon is a resource. It's a resource for me as a scientist. I want to see the history of that stuff. You know, the moon's been in spinlock resonance uh, for 3 billion years. So there's a history there that's very unique. Um, the water on Mars, you know, it's a resource. It's probably everywhere underfoot or in a large sense. And it's also a place where there could be relics or biosignatures of Martian life, if there ever were any. And so we have to protect it. We have to use it, protect it, and think about it. And so all these are big questions, some even ethical. You know, do we contaminate the Martian environments where life could be? And these are ones taken up by people, not me. So anyway, to your question, to your point, um, I think space exploration breeds a togetherness in many ways. And yes, there have been times when it's been us against them, can we mm -hmm. copy you and beat you and whatever? Mm -hmm. And maybe that was good. You know, a little bit of a competition's good. Mm -hmm. We compete our missions, so they're not just, let's just do this. It's mm -hmm. a competitive environment. We bring in international partners to add value, to reduce cost to any one partner. Um, and so the examples of those have been wildly successful. And the International Space Station is a good example, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know. So I would hope that we can do some of these things together when those women and men go to Mars, I would hope it's a planet Earth endeavor. There may be a couple of lead nations that want to put more money in, whatever, entrepreneurs, billionaires, mm -hmm. whatever they are, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. But I would hope we go together because I think we'll benefit more. Yes, there'll be some technologies that someone pioneers first. I mean, you know, aspects of some of those, those computing IT technologies you, you made make working in space better, smarter, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, that's a domain to push those because the benefits are enormous. You know, right. we have an experiment that we flying by Venus that could generate hundreds of gigabits. We'll never get it all back. But we have an AI machine learning tool that will send back 
enough for us to see what it's telling us. Mm. Wow. You know, I mean, we don't have an internet to Venus yet. So we might have to be selective initially in what we can get back from the tools that could collect so much data. Um, so anyway, my point, Dave, I guess, long-windedly, is I like the idea of competition, however it's constructed. But I think when we work these things together as much as we can, it does serve that uniting function that was talked about at the Humans to Mars conference. Um, because it, it gives a place for everyone to see a piece of of this of this journey. And you know, that's how exploration in the in the in the oceanic domain coming out of the Renaissance was. It started as nation states pushed exploring for economic benefits and all the other, you know, ones they had. Sure. And it transitioned into more collective exploration in different places. And and yeah, there'll be issues who owns or who is allowed to have a research base in some place on the moon or Mars and how's that gonna work and blah, blah, blah. And in some sense, the space lawyers will probably figure it out um, in some ways, I guess. Uh, they're smart right. folks. But but again, I'm bullish about doing these things together. I've seen the benefit of that. And it's so incredible, you know, to not try for that at least, you know, anyway. Right, well, I've seen that for sure on the space station. My dad was on station for uh, 12 years or so, I want to say, with Boeing and uh, on the shuttle for two and a half decades with uh, with IBM. Um, the cooperation, you know, it's one of the things they say is when you get these people on station, yes, of course they love their country, but they are co-explorers and they got along pretty amazing, remarkably well, they're um, regardless of whatever the the conflicts may be on Earth, they are up there doing their job. Scientists and astronauts tend to, you know, when you get on a mission like that together, you tend to uh, you tend to bond, and you break down social barriers, you break down um, country barriers. In in their country, it may be that women aren't particularly represented in their industry, and yet they're working amazingly with. Uh, American women or Canadian women or whatever, without rancor, without issue, just everybody's doing their job. They're all qualified to be there. I love those. I'll be curious to see how this plays out. And I don't want to put you on the spot. It, 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 there is a theme I see in technology. Somebody once said to me, look, there are a number of nation states that aren't launching aircraft carriers anymore and then running them through sea trials. They are developing different generation of technologies or weapons or ways to um, be efficient so they can compete in the marketplace and they compete in the in the area of ideas and so there's value in us not losing sight of the of um, these goals to be first first can matter cooperatively great but if but if uh, there are there are groups of people that don't share a common not just an exploration bug but a for the benefit of uh, of human beings bug, human flourishing bug, um, as opposed to the state, then, then maybe they're not their great uh, allies. Yeah. But anyway, I'm not going to take you down that rabbit hole. Let me ask you this. I know we just have a little bit of time left. Two quick things I want you to be thinking about. First is, what haven't we talked about that we should have? But before you get to that, I've lately become exposed to this idea of space weather, our star, space weather, and we probably don't have enough time to really dive into this conversation on it, but how big of a thing, I'm familiar with space debris and the conversation around debris and and even the conversation about putting these big, um, whether it's Starlink and their networks and others, that these are the benefits, but you know what are the risks and how does that, and we're, we're working through things like that. How, do, how is weather playing into this? I, I don't know that I've ever really thought about weather before when we say space weather. What is space weather? And why is it something we should be concerned about? So, Dave, great point. Space weather is not the weather we have in our beautiful, water-rich atmosphere sitting here on clement planet right. Earth. Space weather is the energetic domain, the <clears throat> collisional domain at every scale known to a woman or man that comes from our parent star. We live with a star. Right. NASA actually has a program called Living with a Star. Can't avoid it. You can't. You can see our sun. She's pretty good. We're going right. by with the Parker Solar Probe with these brilliant flybys now. By the way, if you haven't seen, they're just stunning um, examples of technology. But anyway, we live with the sun, and the sun is a massive producer of energy. 
across the electromagnetic spectrum. We feel the effects, be, but protected from them with our large geomagnetic field here on Earth. Mm -hmm. Without that, we would be naked in the breeze of the solar wind. Mm -hmm. And as at Mars, it would strip away our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We would be a different planet. Mm -hmm. But we have a big internal dynamo, generates a magnetic field that produces this Earth we live on. It's a wonderful you know, kind of force field in the sense of a mm -hmm. Star Trekian thing. And so our planet's protected largely, but we still see the consequences, the aurora, the measurements of the connections that happen right at the top of the boundary of our geomagnetic field where we have satellites now, arrays of them um, measuring those things. We have a whole program to study the physics of the sun's interactions, both on earth and with other planets, mm -hmm. with brilliant investigators flying missions, like the Parker Solar Probe, the Solar Dynamics Observer, missions coming up like something called GDC. I won't bore you. So mm. we live with the output of the sun. The solar wind and storms from the sun, from what we call coronal mass ejections. I mean, who doesn't love a CME? Right. You know, it sounds like something out of country <laughs> music, but right. it's not. It's something from the sun. And when the sun does that, that's a storm. It's like a tidal wave moving um, a million kilometers an hour can reach the earth in an hour or so and really pound us with these heavy energetic protons that can affect us. They affect our satellites. They can shut down things. And that's why as we move out of the protective Van Allen belts of our planet, the limits of our geomagnetic field, we're in a space weather zone. And there also is another aspect of space radiation from our sun and from other aspects of our universe. There's the galactic cosmic radiation background from other stars and other things interacting through our little solar system in the Milky Way. And that energetic presence is there. On Earth, we don't feel it. If you're on mm. Mars, you feel it every day. Mm. And so the crew on Mars or the moon will have to be protected from space weather, galactic cosmic radiation background, and other effects that are microparticle collisional um, that we don't even see. On the moon, I have a sample I've studied about the size of a marble that has pockmarked with little millimeter craters in it. Little piece of splash glass that in fact, John Young picked up on Apollo 16. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, that if you look at that under a special kind of microscopes, there are a lot, there's fields of craters. That thing was only sitting out in the, in the micrometeorite environment for tens of millions of years. So it's collisional. And the collision happens in all these energy domains. Space weather is about those collisions and interactions that on Earth we're protected from. On Mars, we're not. Venus, strangely, because it's a slow rotator, maybe, does not have a big geomagnetic field. But she still has a big atmosphere. So she's telling us something. Did she have a field and lose it? Did she not? And that's because she's rotating too slowly. What's going on? So space weather is critical. It's critical to communications by satellites, to GPS, to the crews on shuttles and stations, to people that will go on Lunar Gateway, to people on the moon when the women go. You know, it's part of life in space. And yeah, it's scary, but it's surmountable as we understand it. And monitoring and understanding it the way we monitor storms on Earth is critical. So NASA has a program. We also work with the Air Force and other agencies to understand space weather because mm. it is going to be integral to our lives. You know, back in the 19th century, there was one space weather event where literally all the telegraph systems on Earth shut down. And if one of those big pulses, one of those giant um, uh, coronal mass ejections happened, it could shut down GPS, satellites, communications, internet, power grids. They would feel the energy from the sun so much they'd be, they trigger shutdowns. Hmm. And so we need to be aware of those kind of events for the betterment of, of humanity and for isn't thriving. In, isn't it inevitable that that's, I mean, mathematically, you would imagine yeah. that yeah. it's inevitable. Yeah, and that seems a big pretty, star. Yeah. I mean, it, the sun's a big star that we barely understand, and and yet we're learning. Parker's telling us. And so as we get to and look at other stars smaller than our sun, you know, red dwarfs and things, um, M-class stars that we'll see with James Webb and the planets around them, mm -hmm. we'll start to be able to make better comparisons fundamentally in physics. And, you know, experts like John Mather and other astronomers can explain that better than I. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's space weather is very important. And so your point about bringing it up is critical because as we establish space networks that allow us to communicate and data and navigate in space, in cislunar space, when we get back with there with, with Artemis and the women on the moon, mm -hmm. um, 
we're going to have to know how to handle that. We may have the node shut down. We may have to have special um, protective systems to make sure these systems don't get fried by events. There was a right. Halloween 2003 event that actually shut down an experiment in Mars orbit hmm. that was not protected from the surge of solar protons that hit the spacecraft, Mars Odyssey. So, right. you know, unbelievable, Dave, what we live with in that part of is, the universe beyond our shores. Is there any evidence on uh, perseverance or curiosity that they've been, like, that they have these little pock marks or that they've... That's a I'd, good question, Dave. I, um, I'm thinking, you know, now curiosity has been running around Mars for 10 years. Right. I don't think we see micrometeorites. We've run into meteorites that we've sampled with the instruments. Right. Um, we've seen, you know, uh, octahedrites, iron nickel meteorites right. that fell from making small craters. I don't think we've seen that we have on uh, on lunar missions, seen that. And we have experiments in lunar orbit on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to measure what happens to things in space in that environment. And right. some some of the experiments going to the moon as part of the commercial lunar payload services program will measure micrometeorite flux better than we have. Um, right. So we understand how well we have to protect our, our crew when they go, you know, for long periods of time with Artemis. It's a, it's a crazy universe, Dave. Can, can astronauts really do anything other than be astronauts? Could you imagine that interview process? So here's the thing. Um, we're going to send you to someplace that's doing it, everything it can to kill you all the time. And, by the way, just when you think you've got all these things figured out, you may just have this space weather that's going to hit you so fast, a tsunami that's going to hit you so fast that by the time we detect it, it will be a year after it hit you. And it's going to look like this. And here's the thing. And you still get people who raise their hand. That might be, uh, that might be concerning. I don't know if I want one of my kids to date somebody like that. I think we could do this, babe. Let's, let's try this out as they – anyway – so what I, think we, those people, yeah. I think those people have the trust, um, the trust to do it and to know that our engineering people are, are ready to take on that challenge. We will, may have to have refuges. We may have to have live in lava caves if there's a solar storm, if we get a warning. Right. Um, and a space weather warning system is part of the stuff we want to set up for Artemis. So we don't leave our poor crewmates sitting in the solar wind being pounded. Large amounts of polyethylene can shield and reduce the load from the big storms. So we may have to have special places people go, you know, like safe rooms where they let they ride out the storms. And right. um, it turns out that water is one of the best protectors against those big, fast moving protons. So the more ice you have around you, the better kind of like you know you want to be in an ice box to uh protect yourself um but we're on it the engineers and scientists and space docs uh, you know they know these things are impediments we don't want to kill our women and men going to space or even <laughs> if we send any dogs i you know right. keep the dogs alive um and and we know that and that's one of the things about adapting to space that's so important anyway well, I know we got to go in a minute. So when we come and we we convince you to come back again next time, what are we gonna? What haven't we talked about today that we should talk about next time? I think, Dave, one of the questions for you and and everyone is, you know, where are we going to be in fifty years? Mm. You know, this first 50, 60 years of space, it was a wild roller coaster. Apollo, Hubble, space stations, rovers on Mars. I once spoke to one of the Apollo astronauts, and I showed him what we were going to do with Curiosity. And he says, wow, I wish we had thought of that. Right. You know, we were walking to do what those rovers are doing. Right. Well, like, gee, Jim. And, you know, in the can-do astronaut way. Right. And I thought, well, you know, but you guys did it pretty right. fast and very efficiently. But we're doing it now robotically. So I think plus 50 is going to be fascinating because exploration is a now a digital exploration world. And it's connectivity, sensory you know, it's going to expand and I think we'll see stuff and know stuff that we didn't realize when we did the first wave, that we were mm. just coming to know. And once we know it, we'll be able to adapt it and, and use it better and go there better. You know, we'd always like to go anywhere, anytime in space. Well, even in Star Trek, that was tough. I mean, right. as we know. And, uh, you know, even in Dune, Frank Herbert didn't invent that. They could only, you know, the Guild could only do so much with um, their their ships and launch and stuff. But But right. nonetheless... I think that's going to be a good question because the investments today in the 20s will open the door to where we are, you know, in the 
20, 50, 60, 70s, as we come full cycle 100 years into a space age. And that, you know, I just, I'm bullish on it. I think immersive virtual reality connecting, I mean, the holodecks of the future are coming. And right. that'll be a way where we can all be part of it if we want to be. I mean, amusement parks may be holodecks about being on Mars. Think of that, you know, uh, we're going to the holodeck, mom, and we're going to do, you know, Olympus Mons today. Okay. You know, right. Susie and, and Billy come back and don't fall, you know, whatever. Right. So anyway, I think, I don't think we've seen anything yet. And, um, and learning from space will let us live better here if we apply those lessons. And so I'm bullish on that. That's why I want to go to Venus with our mission, which is called Da Vinci. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to uh, learn more about Da Vinci. I'm going to research it, and uh, maybe we talk about that a little bit more as well. I just, I, I'm so familiar with at least the general conversations around the Moon, um, low Earth orbit, and Mars. Fascinating things. I think they're they're all stepping stones. But I had never really spent time on the idea of uh, of Venus, and why not? I mean, it's, if we can learn how to, with the robots, solve this and we can find them easier so we can launch long-range missions, why not do it? So, well, Dr. Garvin, thank you very much for coming on today. It's been a, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dave, for having me. Anytime. Really appreciate it. Love your interest. Thanks for all the great commentary. Uh, my great pleasure. We'll make sure that we include links to... Um, Goddard and to uh, the programs you've got that you're a uh, principal investigator on for Venus. Thank you very much for joining. And if you've enjoyed the show, we ask that you like, share, subscribe, and comment. We'll see you next time, everybody, on the QTS Experience. Take care. <laughs>